this event. So there are two goals of this event, to provide founders an opportunity to learn from Rebecca and also connect Rebecca with the local ecosystem players and all early stage founders. So we'll start just uh, the co-host um, to introduce a little bit about yourself, uh, Rodrigo and uh, Hannes. You like to go, should I start? Yes, please. Okay, so hi guys, my name is Rodrigo, but they call me Rada. So I'm based in, in Malmo. Yeah, I guess many of you guys are from the region. Usually I work for Sony and Sony being um, a corporate and we have so many business units, so many angles. But within Sony, I work for a unit that was responsible for early stage investments on, on tech startups. So we run an accelerator and uh, we'll invest around 10 to 12 companies per year, quite early stage uh, between pre-seed to seed level. And we also collaborate quite a lot of our next round of investment, which would be the Sony Innovation Fund investing on, 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 on Series A onwards. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm super excited to also you know, learn from Rebecca and us to hopefully contribute to some kind of questions. Uh, so yeah, nice to be here. Looking forward to talk to you guys. And Hannes. Yes, hello everyone. And thank you for having me today. Um, I work, uh, my name is Hannes van Lunteren. I work at Cronova Incubator and Science Park, uh, which is placed in Kifranstad. Uh, I work as a business designer and I'm head of Cronova Food. I've been working with uh, innovation support for SME companies for the past, uh, food companies for the past 10 years. Uh, we work with startups, acceleration, and um, general business development for SME food companies. Uh, we work with companies from earth to earth. That means from uh, SLU or the Agricultural University all the way to biogas, which means includes uh, every part of the chain. Which makes it a bit fluffy, but it, but it's it's the only way to 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 not cut it because we have uh, transportation, we have uh, apps, we have uh, we work with. Uh, I started working with artists and food companies, but now uh, it's everything from artists and food companies to farmers to uh, app companies to uh, high grade. Uh, um, purified um, insect protein and, and so on. And we work also with companies outside of Skåne, but um, we're financed to work within Skåne. So that's that's our main focus. Yeah, so just a quick word about Skåne Startup. It is a startup community building organization, and we are on a mission to build a connected and diverse startup ecosystem. And for today's event, we'll start with the invite, uh, investor fireside chat with Rebecca. We'll have a, a few questions for Rebecca and, and the, all the founders and the co-hosts. Feel free to jump in, raise your hand and ask questions. And then in the second part, we will have the startup pitch and each startup will have three minutes, uh, follow up with the five minutes uh, questions and feedback uh, from Rebecca and the co-host. So we'll jump in, uh, we'll jump in and uh, we'll start uh, the uh, uh, fireside chat with Rebecca. Uh, and Rebecca, uh, you have a fascinating journey um, before you joined Industrial Fonden in 2019. And you started your career as a finance manager and a senior auditor. And then you became the CFO and the CEO for Verreini. It is an investment firm uh, investing in uh, Nordic growth companies. So would you please you know, uh, share with us a little bit of your earlier career journey? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for inviting me today and um, all these exciting founders and uh, really knowledgeable panel here. So super excited about the Malmö startup scene. It really seems to be on fire. So cool to be here. Um, so yeah, I do have, a, I guess, a little bit of an unconventional background getting into VC. But then again, I don't think there is sort of a conventional way to get into VC. Um, but uh, Back at uni, I don't think I even actually knew that much about venture at all. So it's a bit of a coincidence that I ended up in venture. And so I started off working at Ernst & Young and realized uh, after a while that I, I wanted to work on the operational side and, and actually do things in a finance organization and, and got recruited as a CFO by an entrepreneur and investor called Tommy Jakobsson who had sold his uh, uh, company and started an investment company called Varen. 
and that had invested in all sorts of things. Uh, for example, the headphones that Hannes are wearing, <laughs> Marshall and, and the Sound Industries was one of the investments. And they needed a CFO to, to both work with their internal control and finance function, but also with the companies in the portfolio. So they did that for about a year and then uh, some things happened in the company and Tommy asked me to be CEO and, uh, and I was naive enough to say yes. <laughs> and uh, that's how I also started working with uh, the investment side of things and, and worked a lot closer with Tommy and the board and really got hooked on the investment role. Uh, and uh, after having my first kid and recruiting a, a new great CEO, I stayed on on the investment side, which has been such a lucky thing for me because I love it a lot. So uh, yeah, it was a bit of a coincidence, but I've been doing it ever since. Yes, you, you continue to work as investment manager for Zenith Group. And it, it is actually funded by Tom Jacobson. And yeah. together with them, you raise like 300 million sec uh, to invest mm -hmm. in Swedish tech companies. So what are some of the exciting companies that you invest in? Yeah, so I was part of starting up the CNIT uh, funds and uh, we had uh, time to do a couple of investments before I left. For example, we invested in True Color. Uh, we also invested in Vion Labs and uh, an EdTech company called Strawbees and yeah, quite a few, an eSport company called Strafe. And we had quite a broad, uh, but still tech focused portfolio. Um, so yeah. And the a little bit the uh, uh, industrial fund then, and it's founded in 1979, more than 40 years ago. Um, is you mentioned that it is a purpose-driven fund with a mission of creating the innovation of tomorrow. Uh, now you invest in early stage startup in life science, deep tech, and transform transformative, transformative tech sectors. Would you please tell us a little bit about the history and the vision of the fund? Yeah, sure. So we've been around for over 40 years. So uh, back before the IT bubble, uh, I think there were as many funds as there are today. Uh, and today I can only think of us and North Zone and a couple of others that actually are still around. And um, we were, you know, set up as a fund, but with a foundation as an owner. And the foundation purpose is to stimulate new technology and shape the industry of tomorrow and make sure that we find sort of new innovation that can be part of shaping uh, and transforming sort of Sweden's new industry that we need to be competitive as a country and that we need to meet sort of the global challenges that we will face as a country. Um, so that's sort of the overall goal. Let me do that in three sectors, as you mentioned. So it can be anything from a new innovative drug to a new material or energy solution in deep tech or, or a software company disrupting a new market in a, in a novel way. So it can be fairly broad still, but we have that purpose behind, uh, behind us and it drives us, yeah. And we understand that you have a different fund structure. Would you please explain to the entrepreneurs uh, how your fund structure differs from a typical VC fund and how does that affect your investment strategies? Hmm. Yeah, so it's an evergreen structure, which means that we reinvest the money we make from an exit. And it also means that we don't have a fund that is closing in five to seven, eight, nine years, but, uh, which also means that we can take some slightly longer bets. And I think some of the most successful companies we've founded have taken a little bit longer than the typical fund size of 10 years. Like Oatly, I think we've been owners in Oatly for what, 18 years or something from like the very beginning. And same with uh, Oncopeptides that's publicly listed. Uh, we've also been owners for a very long time and taking it all the way from research to an FDA approved uh, drug. So yeah, that's one of the differences. Another one is uh, like the time we can spend since we're not raising any fund we spend all our time sort of on deal flow and on the companies we invest in so I think we have a little bit more time to spend as active owners uh, which is an advantage and uh, we can also be long term in terms of money uh, so we can invest initially as little as sort of 10 million CAC 
but then we can follow on and invest up to 200 million in a single company. So we can follow on and take our Pravata for a really long time. Um, so that's another advantage. Hey, uh, so everybody who are in the discussion, feel free to uh, raise hand and ask questions. And I will continue with my next question is that, uh, uh, would you please elaborate a little bit of uh, how does your team evaluate the startups? I think everybody here is very interested in knowing. Um, mm. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of things we look at. Uh, I think we all, always start with sort of the problem that the companies are trying to solve and try to really understand, is this a significant problem? Is it widespread enough? Is it important enough uh, to solve? And then in we also look, of course, at the normal sort of VC things like global potential, uniqueness, scalability, competitive barriers over time. And um, of course, the transformative aspects that I mentioned connected to sort of our purpose in the fund. Uh, are they able to sort of transform an industry in the right direction? Or um, is this research that can enable truly novel sort of technology to be created and uh, enable new industries even or markets. Um, then we always consider if it does this make sort of move Sweden in a better direction. Um, and that's important to us. Um, we always consider as well the team, but I would say a lot of other funds em emphasize team a lot, you know, and it almost feels you like you have to fit into a set mold as a founder. And I think here we can be a little bit more flexible. I mean, for us, the important thing is that the, the founders are these kind of time travelers, like able to see, you know, into the future almost in terms of uh, consumer behavior or, or how to operate the uh, differently on a market or the need for a new material that we can't really see today, but we will we'll need it in the future. And then through their products sort of transform us into that future and, and that they have this, you know, deep insight into a certain area and a new understanding of something in a different way. And if they have that with a, you know, new technology and everything else is in place, I think we can often work with the founder I think someone needs to meet. Yeah, uh, Hannes, would you please? Uh, probably. Uh, yes. Thank you. Rebecca, yeah. please. No, so then, I mean, you don't always, as a founder, maybe need to be CEO or you can always talk with that company. So team is important, of course, and you need to want to be in that sort of ownership relationship together and do this together with an investor. But I think we can be flexible there as well. Timing is really important and really hard uh, is the timing now. And I think the evergreen structure helps us to be a little bit more flexible on that side. Uh, and then one last thing that I talk about a lot that might sound a little bit fluffy, but it's like, do you have an unfair advantage as a company? And what I mean here is sort of what is your secret sauce? What is your edge that will, you know, also that will stay with you and mean that you can sort of become the category leader or builder in this market, that unique insight or knowledge or connections or whatever it might be or research or something that, that stays with you and makes you the winner in this category. Um, so yeah, those were some of the things we look at. <laughs> it's a long list. I think I have want a to... question. Yeah. From, yes. From, yeah. Yes. Oh, uh, did anybody raise a hand yet? Yeah. I, I don't. Yeah. yeah, Rod. Yeah, please. Oh, just a question, um, Rebecca. When it comes to your investment, uh, you can invest from 150 million to 400 million. You mentioned SAC. Uh, do you usually come in a Series A? Do you have a preferable phase so the startups can know? Uh, is there hmm. any kind of metrics? Like, uh, I know that some, some of VC, some colleagues like ourselves, Sometimes we have a metric is minimal 1 million euros ARR and et cetera. Any kind of metric you can share with the teams mm -hmm. or and where to invest so we can clarify to all of us? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So we, we can be a little bit flexible. We can enter fairly early. We typically want to invest at least 10 million, which means it's often in our seed round. Um, 
but then we can also enter in an A round and the recent investments we made have ranged from 10 million to 70 million even in a vaccine company that we recently, so it can really be in a range, yeah. So do you need to lead or do, are you okay have somebody else leading? Sorry, Matthias, just a follow up. Yeah, we often okay. lead actually, yeah. Okay. That we like to syndicate as, as, as well, it's not a must, but mm. sometimes we find it's a benefit for the entrepreneur to have at least two VCs joining early on to help. Mm. So we often syndicate. Yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Matthias, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have a question um, uh, about different uh, branches and a different amount of money because the branch I'm in is land based fish farming and we're going to pre seed or seed we, the, depending on what you see. And mm -hmm. It is a branch where you need a lot of money on the first investment compared to maybe a, a software development and other of, uh, so I'm just, uh, that is where I am right now trying to, uh, and right now I want to ask you how, what is your main uh, advices on like how we could value the company as high as possible uh, in like this really early stage because we need that much because this is like you have to build a facility. Yeah, that, that's a hard question without knowing enough about your company. But it, often if you have a lot of IP value in your company and the process that you've developed for your fish uh, farming, that that has a value in itself might mean that you don't always need to, you know, talk about KPIs and revenue. In your case, you might have an actual technological value or IP value in what you've already built but that you might be able to attach some value to in this fund. But it's tricky if you need a lot of money up front for sure. And uh, you might need to consider like soft money in together with VC money or, or other options if it's a lot that is needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph. Yeah. Uh, hi, Rebecca. Really interesting to hear your story. Uh, Joseph here from Wake. I was wondering, what's the most common reasons why you don't invest in startups? Well, off, like quite a few companies uh, can build successful and, and, and nice businesses, but without maybe having the, the true VC potential of their business, like being able to to give like 10 X returns in a reasonable amount of years, like become like really grow fast and become really big fairly quickly. Um, and that's not for everyone. And, and quite a few companies I meet don't really have that potential. Maybe because the market size isn't big enough. Maybe they aren't able to scale fast enough. Maybe the product isn't unique and there's a really competitive market and we know that the pricing will go down and yeah, scaling will be hard and, and the lack of that sort of uniqueness is often um, a reason to, yeah, that we say no. So, but it varies for sure. Mm. To follow on that question, uh, when you're talking mm. about the uh, the market, the potential, because every founder will tell you that, uh, you know, they're in a high potential market or industry. So from an investor perspective, how do you evaluate this market, a truly high potential market? Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, this is always hard and it's especially hard if you're building truly transformative uh, things, if you're even maybe creating your own market as you go along. And some of the biggest sort of winners, like category creators, they are building their market as they go along. So you have to sort of be able to, to predict and guess what the market will be in a couple of years. And, and that can be really hard. Of course, if you're sort of challenging, uh, you know, with a product on a current market, then you can always look at sort of market research and reports. And here, a common mistake that I see companies do is sort of they say, oh, the e-commerce market is 700 billion euros in Europe and we're gonna take 1% and that's gonna make us great. <laughs> and, and then that's the only sort of market research they've done. And here I really like companies that, I mean, of course, you know, might need to know your overall market size, but also do a bottom up uh, analysis and think about, you know, what are our potential customers that we can actually target 
and uh, times sort of what we're planning to charge those customers and how, how large is that market chunk uh, and have that sort of reasoning. Uh, Katarina. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm from Eduwegi. Uh, I have. A, I want to go back to the validation theme and uh, ask about because we get questions. We have a budget that is based on what we mm. sell today, and uh, in five years we uh, think that we are going to have a revenue of about a hundred million sake and a margin of twelve million. And then uh, investors ask us, well, how much will uh, you be valued for them? And we just don't have a clue. Hmm. How, how do you think when, when you do the, the validation? Hmm. Can, can, can we say, I mean, our target is like 250, 300 million, but we don't know. We, no, that is really hard. Um, when looking it at is. Sort of alternative proteins, another thing to consider is like, how will this become commoditized and sort of how many competitors will you have? What will happen to your pricing model? Will it mm. go down? Will you be able to charge as much as now? Or will mm. your product become premium for some reason? Because you have mm. like, unique, yeah, yeah, uniqueness attached to your products so and meaning you can charge more, but more, more likely maybe mm. competition will increase which is good you know we want there to be lots yeah of yeah it will for sure we, we absolutely know that in, in your area to say you know what will you be able to charge in five years and what will your margins be then no uh, what, what, what i yeah what i meant was what what will the company be worth yeah and that's attached to what it will okay be worth. I, I see okay yeah. <laughs> okay it's so impossible to yeah. not even no. Can be a bit hard, but, but looking at, of course you look at multiples today uh, yeah and you you think you know is, is multiple going to develop in a positive direction or a negative direction will this you know become more and i think what's what's to your advantage is that you know uh, it's really happening now i mean the consumer behaviors are there they're starting to mm -hmm. really transform into alternative proteins and that's just beginning so hopefully like the demand for this kind of product will only increase uh, and if you have a sort of unique and competitive product on that market that, that is hopefully going to grow even more and become even more volatile and sort of hungry for new alternatives maybe mm -hmm. that can benefit but it is hard uh, yeah, to predict. Yeah. Good, good. Thank you. <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah. yeah, it is. I mean, to us, it's like we don't, we really don't know. But if no. uh, somebody like you also say that you have a hard time answering that question, it's really hard feels now. As an investor, I mean, capital markets are a bit crazy at the moment. Yeah. We've seen, you know, uh, enormous amount of capital floating into the capital markets and, and um, record high number of sort of mm. seed fund capital being invested. So mm. valuations now are, are all time high. So what will happen to them in five years? That depends as well on sort of the world capital markets. And yeah, that's of really course. Nice. Yeah. Which is so hard. <laughs> Extra okay. hard. Yeah. Yeah. Ad yeah. Uh, Adam, you have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Hi. Uh, uh, I was just wondering, like, from a CSR perspective, or like, basically, all startups, I guess, us included, and probably all of us, is kind of in their vision. It's like, you know, we want to change the world in this or that way or whatever. But from a VC perspective, I guess that you are somehow struggling with that to kind of balance the kind of CSR or you know changing the world in a positive way with you know would you for example if you had all the facts beforehand and could choose between investing in a company that would do like a hundred x or a company that would do five x but decrease you know twenty five percent of CO two emissions guaranteed like how would you what company would you choose I'm just wondering like in the VC world, are people getting serious about like wanting to change things or are they just looking at numbers to, to you know, thousand X companies and then 
with the kind of hope that money will change the world eventually? Or like, how do you balance that in the VC world today, you would say? I, I, I do think I've seen a, a large movement in the VC world just the past year. Uh, there's a lot more talk on ESG questions and, and awareness in all these all the funds. Um, and there's a lot more sort of climate tech focused funds coming up in, in all of Europe. Um, and uh, so there is something bubbling and happening and, and a lot is talk. Uh, and some is action as well. And I, I am seeing, you know, funds that seem to be you know, genuinely wanting to make a difference. And there's, you know, the new SCB Green Tech Fund, there's Almi Green Tech Fund, there's Pale Blue Dot, there's, yeah, so there's a lot of like new funds, especially focusing on climate and ESG and also impact funds as, you know. Uh, and I think for us being a foundation owned fund, if we could decrease carbon emissions by 20%, that would be a no brainer. <laughs> like for sure. And I think that would be valued a lot more than 5X. Uh, so, but, you know, we we can think a little bit different. Like our overall purpose is to make Sweden a better place. And that would definitely make Sweden a better place. So that would be easy for us, yeah. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. The example was a bit off, but <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. And Rush, you have to combine them, yeah. Arash, mm -hmm. you have a question. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, thank you, um, Rebecca. You might have uh, you might have quickly uh, touched based upon it, but uh, I'm going to revert back to early stage, very very early stage investment. Uh, as a VC, uh, what would you like to see from the from the startups? If you get to point point a couple of uh, bullet points uh, before you start investing on a very very early stages. <clears throat> The really early stage, it's definitely about the vision. What do you want to create? What is your insight into a problem that you want to solve? Uh, and, uh, and is that vision and what you want to build uh, part of sort of an overall transformation and, and part of a large potential market? And is there an interesting investment opportunity in that? So early, early stage, it's a lot about the sort of problem formulation and the insight and, and your vision of what you want to build. And then, of course, the, the founder's knowledge. Why are you sort of the right people to solve this problem? And, and uh, and why do you have that unique insight? What is your background? Have you worked uh, with a certain customer base for a long time and seen sort of their pain points and problems and have that sort of unique knowledge into solving it? Or are you a researcher that has spent, you know, 10 years deep diving into something and now want to commercialize that research? So, so you can always look at what sort of the, the history of the founders as well. Mm. Thank you. And then ability to attract uh, good people, even though it's early stage, you might have been able to bring aboard someone else with you, either as a founding team or early employee. And that's also a good indicator that you're able to attract like uh, top talent and good people um, to your company. Mm. Hannes, you have a question. Well, you're muted, Hannes. Yes, I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> I think uh, Rode was, uh, had raised his hand before me, um, but, but if it's okay, I'll, I'll go on. I, I'm, I'm a bit uh, naive when it comes to, to these questions, uh, not, not what you're talking about, but it's a lot about hard facts. But working with companies hands-on, it's always about people. And I imagine that, that your business is also about people. So you have the hard facts. You have the market analysis, you have an analysis of whether this is a viable idea, you have an analysis of, of, of uh, or, or, or uh, looking at the vision, looking at uh, the possibility for them to, to produce. But at the end, uh, if you look at, for example, uh, what happened during Corona uh, and the pandemic now, things just went upside down for a lot of businesses. And you see that it's the people that managed to do something with that so if you're especially if you're in a totally new market where where there's i mean it's it's um, um 
what's it called? It's radical innovation. So you're inventing a new product, you're inventing a new market. It's very hard to predict what will happen. Uh, mm. And then I always find that people are more important, actually, than, than, than almost more important than the ID. Because you can always twist the ID, but if you don't have the right people, you can't even even do that. How do you engage in in, in seeing that 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 the people are are are? I'm I'm sounds a bit fluffy, but but I'm interested in how you and how do you engage with within the companies? Are you uh, how does that work? How do you take board uh, part in the board? Are you are you uh, maybe naive questions? But I'm I'm really interested in. in, in, in Hard, hard questions as well, because uh, I mean, people are really, really important, but I also think if you have like truly valuable technology underlying or research or something, you, you can also pivot that research with, you know, so, so people are important, but we also value sort of the innovation in itself a lot. Yes. And I think maybe emphasize we want great teams, but we also are open to recruit, you know, help in recruitment processes to find the right team. I did an investment in a in a great founder that had built a software company, but he didn't want to be CEO anymore. And he was quite open with that. And he's like, it's not for me. I'm I'm passionate about my product and I want to, you know, work with the technology. And that's my call in life. And we what we were fine doing the investment. Anyway, even though he didn't fit the typical, you know, criteria for a mm. founder and recruited a CEO to him <laughs> to mm. make it work. So I think we can be a little bit sort of open, opportunistic and lean forward and, and take action sometimes as yeah. well to sort of help shape that team needed. But yeah, team is really important. And I agree. And, and some of these companies that are our most successful companies today have pivoted. Yeah. Uh, like you funnel did a pivot and mm-hmm. you know we had a belief in the founding team and sort of their new investment type or the new vision for what they wanted yeah. to build but still yeah people are important now, realize it's a hard question because you can do um, due diligence and you can look at the, at, at the hygiene factors that and they are most often the hard factors but how do you do due diligence and 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 look at the hygiene factor when it comes to people that must be harder uh, to, to to be able yeah. to because yeah. um, and i just wanted to add a small thing i was in holland in Eindhoven, well five mm-hmm. or ten years ago and that was the person working for their investment uh, company the university's investment company and he said that out of thousands and researchers, five are entrepreneurs. So there you have it. Should should the researcher be the entrepreneur? Not always. Or you need a team around them because because and I think because, in a lot uh, of our life science companies, uh, yeah. the the research on the shares are not that often the CEOs or no, even no. in the management sometimes. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so it's yeah Hannah's. Hannes, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, Rodrigo, please go ahead. Okay, so thank you. Rebecca, I was thinking, you mentioned at the beginning that you know you, you spent quite a lot of time in, uh, uh, with the companies after you invest. So I'm super curious, what kind of support you can offer the companies after you invest on them? Yeah, so we always take a board seat and want to be the sort of an active strategic advisor to the companies. And... Um, yeah, yeah, between board meetings as well, of course. And that's back to why people and relationships are important as well. Like you really need to make sure that, yeah, you want to work together and that the founder wants to sort of receive uh, a bouncing board of ideas. And here we try to rather sort of ask the right questions then always sort of tell the companies what to do. Um, at least that's how I try to work. <laughs> Rather be a good sort of challenger than you know ha- always having because we don't always have the right answers to everything. So it's more sort of the good challenging sort of bouncing board. Um, we also have a great network. I think we've been around for a long time. <laughs> we've invested with a lot of international investors. Uh, and have a good investor network. We also have a good network of experts or ex-entrepreneurs that we have invested in that we still keep in touch with. Um, 
And uh, so that network is really important. I think most investment managers or directors that you'll meet are sort of half smart generalists, right? <laughs> no, but sometimes really smart, but, <laughs> but uh, not always, right? Um, so you, you really need them to, to know when they don't have the right answer and when it's the right time to involve an expert and then hopefully have that network of relevant people to involve uh, both as board members or as sort of advisors to the company mm -hmm. so we try to, to use a network of, of experts a lot um, another thing is that we facilitate learnings between portfolio companies we have a fairly large portfolio today we have 60 companies and uh, for example, tomorrow we have a SaaS portfolio event. So all the 18 SaaS companies in our portfolio get to, to network. And we have a speaker, VP of marketing at HubSpot is talking about sort of inbound marketing. And we have sort of different, and we have three SaaS growth investors joining in a panel. So they get to sort of ask them questions. So we, so we try to, and then, you know, of course have network uh, opportunities between founders um, and between CMOs or CFOs. So, so they get to interact um, and I want to do even more. We could do even more th of those things, but, um, but- But you facilitate those events, you facilitate the meetings, you bring a specialist or you, it's coming from your guys and inviting the portfolio companies, right? Yeah, we tr that's what we try to do anyway, yeah. Super, super. Yeah, Irene, you have one question. Yes, I wanted to ask you like a bit more something a bit more practical, like uh, what do you expect to see in a pitch deck the first time you see it? Like what would make you really excited that this person said to you their pitch deck? Uh, what maybe from your past like uh, has surprised you and you thought it was a great idea or what was a bad experience with it? Mm, yeah, so pitch deck uh, needs to, I guess, include a lot of things, but uh, starting again with sort of a page where you really uh, define the problem and, you know, what you want to solve, that's number one. <laughs> so I've talked about it a lot now, but that's definitely number one. And then the bottom up and the understanding of your market and the understanding of other sort of players on that market, competitors, partners, you know, um, that's definitely important. And what makes us really tick, I guess, is, I guess, is if you know someone really has thought differently about something, not only incremental improvement about something, but actually thinking in a novel way with a new kind of product or a new kind of business model or uh, that's always that always gets us going a little bit extra that you don't only think better and you don't only listen to sort of what customers think they want but you can understand what they should want <laughs> and be able to think suggest something different you should do it that way with this product and so yeah that's sorry it sounds a bit fluffy but <laughs> and then overall I think it's not going to be sort of the, the best looking pitch deck that wins, but that you get a sense that this founder really understands, the, you know, the market they are approaching and really understands the problem and how the customers work and, and, and getting a sense of that understanding is, is the most important thing. Yeah, yeah Rebecca, your team has uh, made a few investment in Squangne, uh, most recently investing in Okutu. Uh, would you please uh, elaborate with us, like what was the reasons um, that uh, um, made you guys decide to invest in them? Is the company based in Malmö? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so we have a few investments in Skåne, which is great. And uh, the Okta team was actually the founders of a previous, of one of our other investments in Skåne in River. So we knew the team from before. And we also knew that from the in River time, they had gained a lot of that sort of unique insight that I talk about into customer pain points related to sort of data infrastructure and how you manage your data as, um, as a retailer or e-commerce actor. Or, or, and they saw that the product information management, the in river PIM system wasn't enough. There was more you could do with sort of that data, combining it with customer data and external data to create really relevant customer experiences. So we like their unique insight and we like the team, of course, because we'd worked with them before and we were also happy that they wanted to work with us before um, or again. So 
So that was a short background to why we wanted to invest. And we saw a lot of potential in what they wanted to build, but it's also about sort of creating a new category. And that's kind of what they did with InRiver as well. And uh, that, that vision of a new category in data experience management really got us going. <laughs> so we liked their vision and we liked uh, them. Uh, so. mm. yeah, in terms of uh, uh, fundraising, uh, in our last discussion, you mentioned that VC is not the only uh, fundraising channel. You talked about the um, other creative channels, uh, other potential financing solutions, such as the factoring and getting support with the European Investment Bank. Uh, would you please like offer us some examples or of how founders can leverage other financing tools than venture capital? Yeah, and, and uh, venture capital shouldn't always be the number one choice. I, even though I'm in venture capital, it's not for everyone. And there are advantages of being able to bring on other funding and you can build a really great business and uh, yeah, without uh, venture capital in some cases. But so other things to consider is sort of there are several growth banking uh, entities today, like Nordia has one and SCB has one that offer sort of EB guaranteed loans. Um, so they can sometimes offer lending to, to quite good uh, terms as well. And yeah, there's EIB, as you mentioned, there's um, venture debt uh, is not for everyone, but could be an alternative for some. And there are some Swedish, uh, I think SCB has one, and I think DBT offers some lending and Johan Krona Cloud Capital offer lending for a SaaS company. So there are you know, more and more lending solutions to fairly attractive terms as well popping up. Mm. So yeah. If you could share with us, uh, what are some of the failure investment uh, and the, or what, what you have learned from any of uh, the mistakes? Yeah, yeah. As a VC investor, you're always going to have a lot of failures because you're always following sort of the Pareto curve. And even though you always think you're going to beat the Pareto curve, uh, it's, you know, that uh, role of sort of 20, 80, or even one in 10 really successful companies, and then about half becomes nothing, or, or maybe you get your money back. That's just the, 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 how the numbers work in our business. I had one company that I, I didn't do the investment, but I became responsible for it really early on in Varem, and it was a, it was a smart camera. So you could share, it's the South, this is a long time ago, <laughs> uh, so, or eight years ago. So you could share pictures on social media and we decided to do a re, like to invest um, a follow on investment. And then just, I think half a year later, we realized, you know, the smartphone now are so good. This is just, there's not never going to be a market for this product, unfortunately. So that was, I should have never done that follow on investment. We could have realized from, you know, directly that this is not going to happen. But yeah, that was one example. Mm. So it's always hard with the following because, you know, you want to help the founders and, you know, you want to believe their vision still, but then sometimes you just need to know that the market conditions might have changed from when you did the investment and, and it's not going to help anyone to, you know, keep it alive if it doesn't actually have customers or a market to go to. So, yeah. And the, today's uh, topic is the food industry. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious, what made you so passionate about the food tech companies or food yeah. industry in general? So uh, I guess I've always been interested in food. And uh, when, uh, when I was quite young, I uh, had a stomach disease that made me decide to be a vegetarian for many, many years. And I also found out a lot about food and how it could help me. Uh, and it made me feel a lot better. Uh, so I, could, I can see how important sort of food and eating the right things can be for your health. Uh, I also worked as a sh uh, student chef part-time when I was studying. Uh, and so I've always sort of liked food uh, on a sort of amateur hobby level, uh, done a lot of cooking and uh, not done that many investments so far in food. But when I joined the industry fund, then I, I said, this is one area where I think we can do a lot of impact. And it's, you know, 
is one of the things that we need to solve. We have an increase in population, we have climate change, we have so many challenges that food tech can be part of solving. So for me, it, it is necessary for industry funding to, to do more in food tech. And we have done Oatly and we have experience in food tech from, from before. So, so uh, yeah, that's why I wanted to do, yeah, look more into it for sure. Mm. Cool. I think we'll have some uh, super exciting companies to, uh, to pitch today. Well, uh, we are very on time. Uh, we'll just uh, take five minutes break. We'll be back here at the 4.50. Um, so you guys just, you know, go get a coffee, stretch your legs uh, and get ready for the pitching session. Fun. Thanks. Yes.
Hey guys, welcome back. We will start with uh, uh, Katarina. Yes, Katarina. Uh, Does it work, Sunny? Yes, we can see your presentation, but we cannot see your video. But but it's fine. Yeah. Okay. No. No. But you can you can see it soon. I just. <laughs> I'm just trying to, okay, there it is. <laughs> yes. So, so we'll I'm start just, with, yes. But, but you see it uh, also, uh, you see the difference, because I had a problem the other day. So you see next page now. Yes, it works. Yeah, good. Okay, good. So please take us to this uh, uh, vegan revolution. Okay, I'll start right away then. So. I want to present Edgy Wedgy AB, and we are uh, producing uh, plant-based, now I speak English, my intention is to speak Swedish, but it, yeah, well, I try. It's the Swedish presentation, sorry for that, but yeah, I, I try to look at it in Swedish and tell you in English. <laughs> okay, we're producing plant-based uh, meat analogs uh, based on uh, wheat, so-called called Satan. Uh, we started 2020. What we want is to inspire people to eat smart. Uh, we're also going to uh, make our own production during 2021. And we have started a cooperation with SLU to find the most optimal wheat uh, for this production. So what does consumers want? They want more variation. They want uh, soy and no, no alternative to soy and pea. They want a better taste. The market is growing. Actually, this year, it's uh, from, from 20 to 21, it's been growing 40%, the chilled market. This is how it looks worldwide. So it's a huge growth everywhere. Uh, in, in some EU countries, three digits. Why Satan? Well, we can produce uh, products without additives. Uh, it's an Asian concept that actually exists and we have twisted it in uh, to be uh, like more Swedish like it has got a high protein content compared to other um, meat alternatives uh, that is around 16 to 18 we have 25 it has got some unique cooking properties and it's uh, a high sustainability potential uh, three four different products three easy to, uh, to cook, and, and one is an alternative to toast, tofu, halloumi, or even a piece of meat. Uh, the secret with our product is time and temperature. Um, uh, about uh, processed food, uh, we think we have, um, uh, we stand out because our uh, products are, they are processed, of course, all cooking is, is a process. But uh, with no additives, um, if you compare with some of the meat alternatives today, it's highly processed with a lot of additives. We have none. So now it doesn't want to move. Uh, the business we have to go through uh, retailers. Uh, today we are selling to 30 Ica stores. And uh, out of that, we have made, we, we see how much we sell. We have got proof of concept. It does sell, even though we have no marketing. Uh, our um, budget is based on that. And you can see on the X axis that uh, uh, we, we, for every year, we think we can have a growth. Um, and uh, uh, in 2025, we expect 10% uh, market share in this growing market. And that will lead us to uh, a margin of 12 million uh, Swedish kroner. Uh, the team is myself, I'm a chemist and uh, I've been uh, working with food ingredients for basically all my life. Uh, been involved in many development projects on, on, on food in Scandinavia. Uh, Sebastian Bergfeldt, uh, he's uh, uh, right now, he's been a, a purchasing director for Orkla for ICA, and right now he's a senior advisor in at the European Bank of uh, Reconstruction and Development. And we have Yusuf Claudin, who has worked all his life with selling fast-moving consumer goods. Uh, we have uh, the trademark registered in Sweden, and we applied for EU, uh, UK, Iceland, and Norway. 
Uh, first round now, we are looking for 5 million Swedish krona. Uh, that will be used for marketing, uh, for some staff, of course, and also for some um, uh, additions to the line we're going to use. Uh, the exit strategy is an IPO or, uh, or a private M&A uh, in five to seven years. So join the Satan revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Katharina. Uh, Rebecca, please, please. I am sure you have lots of questions. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. That was a good presentation. Um, you went through a lot of things really fast, but it had a lot of content. It was but great. three minutes. <laughs> yeah, it was good. Good speed. I like it. <laughs> um, so you touched upon sort of the high protein content. Um, how, um, besides that, and it having less, um, you know, being less processed, uh, what is what would you describe as sort of your secret sauce or competitive advantage? Uh, texture and taste. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know. Yeah, texture and taste. Uh, this is why, I mean, I turned uh, vegetarian 10 years ago and I found this type of products in the US actually in California way before it came here. And uh, I've been thinking about them ever since. And um, because they take up uh, flavors. Uh, you don't need to mask so much as you do with soy and, and especially pea. And, uh, and they take up flavors really easy. So if you put like our natural seitan in a marinade, you will very fast get the, the taste of whatever you like. Mm. So that's is that something thing. that is hard for someone else to do? Is it something in the process that is, because you're a chemist, that you, yeah. you can patent or that? Uh, no, I, it's, uh, no, I, I, I understand what you're after. Uh, as most foods, even mm -hmm. oatly, is, mm -hmm. can be copied. Uh, yeah. So not like high tech, but of course we claim that we have worked a lot with temperature and time and the process mm -hmm in order to make it this perfect way. But you could actually do your own Satan at home. And if you do it a couple of times, you will find that one, once you succeed, next time, not so much. And so it, it's very, it, it, it is very much about time and temperature. And your go-to-market, is it uh, only through Ica and Coop and distributors? Or what is sort of your plan to, to reach as many customers as possible? Mm. Yeah, our plan is, of course, we need to positioning of ourselves, of course, in, in uh, mm. the best possible way. We have, and, and that is part of why we need money, because mm. this will also be uh, brand building for sure. Mm. Uh, and we want to be the first ones that, because we're sure that there will be more Satan products on the market, but we want to be the first ones uh, to really go to the market and, and show the market, this is what, what it is. Um, and then uh, of course, we, we want to connect ourselves with the Swedish farmers and we want to make our Satan even better by finding the absolute optimum wheat and and that is what i'm talking to slu about now to find that and i mean the the, the dream is really to have a a, a a factory run by sun energy that will be sort of we we actually have a small plan for that but but that is that is a couple of years ahead i yeah. think no, did i answer your question <laughs> yeah yeah sure uh... So, so you are planning to mostly or sell through all channels. Yeah, only, yeah, but through yeah. I mean, this is chilled um, mm. goods. So, to I mean, for w when distribution becomes even sharper than it is today, uh, for sure we can sell via um, internet, of course. Uh, but um, right now, uh, the best way we think is to go through retailers to get listed there, to get their distribution, waiting for that. Uh, tic Tac time is running. So we go through a company called Movement who's got a sales force that are working on all the, the, the single Ica shops. Uh, so they will go out to 500 this year. 
to uh, to get uh, the higher sales for us to get a higher sales capacity and then there are some other companies along the way that we are using to remind the ICA. You, you would think that ICA would be interesting to, to the, the, the single shops would be interesting to get more sales, but they have sales enough. So you need to push them even, even to order new material. What's the value prop for ICA? Uh, it, is it better margins or better interesting? Yeah. Tools? When you sell yes. to them, what uh, makes them tick? Sort of, yeah. uh, uh, what them. makes yeah. them tick is definitely Swedish production. Mm. A lot of the products today are not produced in Sweden, even mm. not ICA's own. Mm. So yeah. for sure, that makes them tick. Mm. Marketing, uh, if, if we show them uh, a marketing plan, uh, we would, if we would have had money to do it, we would already be listed. For sure we we have talked to them for two years now and of course this is a new uh, protein source even if you feel okay wheat maybe not so sexy as you can find your very special pea but we have a lot of wheat in sweden we we are going to be able to grow we can produce for the whole world more or less um so uh, that is also something that uh, they are interested in to to have a new protein base that actually has got the right price tag. Mm. Cool. Yeah, thank you for the uh, uh, Rebecca. Thank you for the questions. Uh, we will continue with Adam from Raging Peak, and he's on a mission to uh, revolutionize the bacon industry. Thank you. Uh, I, I just sent you an email with. Yes. I, oh, yeah. You, yeah, you're sharing it because because my uh, internet is a bit weird. I guess there's a lot of people surfing at Ullaget or something. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, you're sharing, right? Yeah. Yes. All right. So um, my name is Adam, and I'm one of the co founder of the Raging Pig Company. Um, we can change the slide um, and we have a lot of extensive experience in helping leading brands startups and charities to make sense in today's media landscapes from a communication perspective um, and um, in time for corona we found ourselves at a place where we realized that we didn't want to use our expertise to help the old dinosaur brands anymore. So we decided to take that expertise and try to do something that we truly believe in ourselves. And that would be to drive the plant-based revolution that I believe that we all needed a few years ago. Um, and it all starts with bacon. Uh, bacon is probably one of the most engaging food product in the world. And even though we're living in the year of 2021, it's still made from real life loving pigs. Next, <laughs> sorry for the, uh, um, as you probably all know, the plant-based market is hotter than our planet and is growing five times faster than total food sales. And the global bacon market will probably hit 59 billion this year. Um, Next, uh, the ongoing increase in global bacon consumption is highly problematic from a number of reasons, not only for pigs, but for our health and in the long run for the sake of our planet, the way it's produced today. Um, the Raging Pig Company uh, will let you baconify anything in seconds in a healthier, more sustainable, and more importantly, a cruelty-free type of way. Uh, our mission is to use the power of bacon, pop culture, and food tech and merge those three ingredients uh, to speed up the change and inspire and educate more people to go plant-based. Our go-to-market product is our bootstrap chef-approved bacon seasoning um, that would take any meal to the next level in the matter of seconds. We'll launch it in a couple of weeks uh, through Kickstarter. So we, we've run the pre-launch. So we're very close to launch and 
yeah, I'm currently at set for the video. That's why I'm a bit all over the place. Um, our first product line includes uh, bacon bits, vegan bacon marinade, and vegan bacon jerky. And they're all non-refrigerated products. So our intention is to be able to build brand awareness, because that's our background, and connect the engagement in digital channels with a digital call to action within plant-based and kind of build the brand first and kind of plug in more R&D intense products as we go. So of course our flagship product or end goal is to develop the world's best vegan bacon, friable, uh, vegan, friable vegan bacon um, with the goal to be able to solve it as good as if you're like blindfolded, that you won't tell the difference. Um, and our, um, sorry, I can't see the screen at the same time, uh, but you can change, I think. Uh, we have some early traction already. Uh, we have right now uh, about a thousand non-paid ambassadors, TikTok, YouTubers, influencers um, that we're preparing for launch. We have a letter of intent for Coop and a number of other retailers, but we will probably wait to go down the, the reti retail route. And we sold out the pre-launch batch, and right now we have around 60,000 signups for our launch. Um, and our um, go-to-market strategy is to start with the brand awareness and community building, which is what a lot of food and beverages brands are struggling with and kind of missing out on in some sense with the, with the kind of R&D and food tech being very, very hot right now to only focus on the food scientists. Um, to launch and increase adoption and broaden our product range to, to be appealing to vegans and vegetarians and flexitarians and go from there to making plant-based the new normal by normalizing it and kind of focusing on making it cool uh, before talking about health benefits and cruelty-free and stuff like that, as we do believe that coolness kind of tramp trumps a lot of things in today's digital space. Um, and let me see. And yeah, we, we, we'll go we intend to go beyond the actual eatable products and create uh, a strong community uh, and to hack pop culture in, in several ways. Um, so we started a partnership with 1% for the planet and we started a partnership with us animal sanctuary. So we're actually adopting pigs as we go. We just saved our first pig from a slaughtering house uh, with a guy working undercover. So he basically stole a piglet that we adopted which is amazing. Um, so yeah, um, we right now, we, we've founded some money from, we were a part of the Brink Food Tech Accelerator and we've been signing a safe note with New Territory Ventures. And we just got an investment offer from Solina, which is our food developer, a leading food developer. So that we will basically outsource the, the food tech side and the laser focus on the brand building, which is a huge beneficial for us uh, to be able to prove our brand uh, without having to overfund like a Silicon Valley startup and you know try to build our own company or our own facility. Um, so yeah, that's basically us for the moment. And I'm super stressed from the production, so I'm once again, all over the place. So sorry for that. Um, um, there's for a that. bag of seasoning. Yeah, Rebecca, <laughs> please go ahead. Thanks for, for taking the time, even though you're so stressed. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. We were supposed to be done at twelve, but mm. yeah, I'm in the set right now. So. Oh wow! I'm so yeah. curious. <laughs> How do you make this? What do you make it from? So, uh, so basically the seasoning, I mean, without the marketing and the branding, I mean, we did develop it together with a number of chefs in, uh, in mostly in Malmö, the Scandwich founder and a couple of other guys. Uh, so it's basically, you know, salt, smoke, liquid smoke, all natural flavors. Um, but the reason, like the main reason that we focused initially on the seasoning was to create, you know, the, for example, 
bacon crisps that you get at the cinema are actually vegan at, and they have been that all the time but it's kind of the approved fake bacon flavor so it's basically it tastes like that um, so the main reason to choose that for a go-to-market strategy is to start owning the bacon space from a brand perspective and also connecting you know the digital call to action with the huge engagement uh, so so the product is like a i would say 50 percent like a marketing tool and 50 percent you know as a real product but the feedback has been way over our expectation from a taste perspective as well uh, but it's not like you know if you close your eyes you won't think it's bacon because it's a seasoning so the next step is to launch product with the actual texture yeah. Um, how would you yeah, do it's... that? Do you already know what what sort of plant material you'll use, or what? Uh, yeah. So, so Selena, which is now our, I mean, they've been our commercial partner all along, but now they're also uh, joining us a venture, yeah. venture their venture arm. Uh, so they have, you know, a, a, a world leading food science lab, and they just started like one, one and a half a year ago, like a dedicated plant-based food lab. Uh, so they've already started like the master application for, for bacon. Um, so we're looking into both mushrooms and soy base and, you know, depending on the texture and how, you know, natural the ingredients could be. Uh, but I would say that for the moment right now, the way we, the reason we started Rich and Pig was that we've proven ourselves from mostly from a, like an earned media perspective, like PR and been doing a lot of viral campaigns and kind of shown that we know how people act in digital channels, like tomorrow's consumer. And we wanted to kind of try to merge the activism part and the food tech part and the kind of pop culture part. So not, you know, greenwash as we go to kind of build in all of the kind of modern ingredients into a brand. Um, and as one of our investors told us, like, in the, like our first milestones, it's not necessarily, you know, maximizing the sales. It's rather to get uh, like a fan to tattoo our logo on his or her chest or something. Uh, so that's kind of our main innovation or make it or break it would rather be to, you know, show that we can build a, a community and plug in more R&D intense product as we go. Um, so we're pretty aware of that, but we believe that food tech and plant-based alternatives has reached a level where there's a lot of, I wouldn't say white label products, but the, the innovation has reached uh, a higher level than the conversion of consumers, I would say, because there's still a lot of food tech brands that are maybe 10 years from hitting the market. And maybe we're, you know, hundred percent into cultivated meat then, or there's another pandemic and we're we're not even here so <laughs> not to be pessimistic but <laughs> what sort of specific insights or knowledge or experience do you have as a founding team to succeed um, mm, i would say that i mean we've been running startups and projects before so we know like the basic structure and like that we can scale very fast if we get the branding and marketing right and i guess that's you know, in, in my mind, the, you know, external CEO and the kind of business back end is always something that you can hire, but to hire marketing or engagement is way harder. Uh, so we're kind of in some way building a startup from, you know, <laughs> from the other way around. Uh, but but I've, I built, uh, I was involved in Wheelies Cafe as well, which was a, a bicycle cafe that was kind of, you know, a uh, uh, pretty PR intense brand. We did the Y Combinator and stuff like that. And then we failed to to scale from a you know franchise perspective. But um, so I think from a product level, this is much more scalable as we do have the e-commerce potential and the social media potential. And if we're able to build traction from the end consumers, I think, we will have a higher chance of standing out within retail where the real scaling begins as well. Um, so we try to be pretty laser focused on our strengths 
and you know focus on that and not do like ten thousand things at once, um, which is stressful sometimes. But I think that's yeah. what you need to to do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, we will have uh, our next startup, uh, Joseph. Yeah. Please great. Go, yes. Please go ahead and share your uh, screen. Absolutely. So my name is Joseph. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Great. Uh, so I am since 2018 the CEO of Wake, uh, where I'm also a co-founder. So I am originally from Grenna in Småland. So I, I live here in exile in Skåne. Um, um, but uh, I moved here to study business administration and economics uh, eight years ago. Uh, and we started Wake, um, yeah, three years ago. So Wake, um, we describe it as, uh, as the casual way to order and pay. So um, restaurants visit made simple. Uh, so our vision is to um, make smoother and easier um, experiences for both uh, guests and restaurants, basically. So you've, you've probably experienced uh, this yourself that you're sitting at a table having trouble ordering or waiting too long at your, at the, in a line or having troubles getting hold of a waiter. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a problem in most restaurants. Uh, and why is that? We believe that it's basically because of three basic elements. Uh, restaurants are generally a really bad business model because all the guests arrive at approximately the same hours uh, and you reach maximum capacity uh, quite fast. Uh, on the other hand, you need to uh, turn uh, make your whole revenue from these uh, critical hours. And this leads to something that, as we describe as the service paradox. So uh, the restaurant can't have uh, the right amount of staff. You either have too much staff that uh, eats your whole operating margin, or you have too little staff that creates long waiting times and, and bad guest experience. Uh, so uh, if we look at the, the market as a whole, um, we can see that um, uh, in comparison to, to other service sectors, there's a really low operating margin uh, at 2.6%, uh, whereas other service industries have uh, approximately 7-8% operating margins. Um, and since I was born in, in 94, it uh, hasn't uh, happened a lot. Uh, so the productivity increase in the sector is 0 0.2%. Um, and we can also see that a big uh, chunk of their cost is the cost of labor. Uh, as well as uh, food and drinks then, uh, obviously. So it's, it's really a, a sector in need of change. So our solution to this is our uh, smooth and easy order solution where the guests can check in either through scanning a QR code or just check in in the app uh, completely without registration. So they can just sit at the table, uh, order and pay or uh, order in advance and pick up their food or beverage. Uh, and on the other side, uh, side we have a, a tablet that is certified by uh, the Swedish tax agency. So we send um, approved receipts back to the customers. Um, but we also have um, uh, integrations with, uh, with uh, the restaurant's existing uh, systems. Uh, so we can connect to their printers, for example, and print uh, the food uh, to the kitchen and print uh, the drink orders to the bar, for example. Um, on top of this, we're also integrated with um, uh, some of the leading bookkeeping, bookkeeping systems, uh, such as Fortnox or Visma. Uh, and we also have other partnerships with uh, POS systems, uh, salary systems, and um, um, uh, Martin and Servea, for example, which is a, a big player in the industry. Um, so the problem we solve for the restaurants is basically um, service capacity and profitability. So with service, we mean happier guests, less waiting times, increased customer insights. Uh, with capacity, we can see that you can manage up to 50% more guests or more tables, as we often describe it. With profitability, we can see that we can increase the tab, um, not only by side orders, but uh, mainly because in an evening you might order two to three times in a, in a regular bar, whereas we can see that uh, with our solution, you, you order up to four, five, or even six times uh, in an evening because 
we, we cut waiting times and make it so easy for the guests to order and reorder. Uh, we also are working on some algorithms that can provide uh, the user with the smart menus that you, you can have. For if you're vegan, for example, the algorithm will sense that and recommend vegan food or um, the restaurants can also set uh, if they want to promote uh, certain products uh, that are more profitable for them. So we have uh, about uh, 150,000 users that have downloaded and used the app and, uh, and 160 satisfied uh, restaurants uh, across Sweden. Uh, so we're not really geographically bound because uh, yeah, so, so we have from, from Kirna in the north to Ista in, in the south. Uh, uh, and we're also launching now in Norway and Denmark as well. So a uh, little bit uh, short about our vision of uh, the restaurant market. We believe that uh, restaurants of tomorrow are sustainable, digital and full of millennials. And uh, with full of millennials, I mean, um, uh, it's a, a completely different generation that eats out five times more than their parents did. And there are also um, many examples of building um, urban living without kitchens and, and you purchase uh, food as a service uh, much more often. And they expect another type of service uh, that is quick, easy and uh, on demand. So that's what we provide. We also can see that uh, in other economies uh, that hasn't uh, have um, had uh, a high percentage of car payments, you're leapfrogging directly from cash to mobile. Uh, so this we can see in China, for example, but also in Southern Europe, uh, where you go directly from cash to, to mobile payment. And therefore, we, there's no need for these expensive POS systems or the, the payment terminals that we have uh, in Sweden everywhere. So this is uh, a potential for us that we can uh, leapfrog this uh, half digital step in the uh, payment uh, system industry. So if yeah. we... Yeah, Joseph, we're a little bit running out of time. Um... Yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll make it short. Uh, so our revenue in 2021 has really taken off. Uh, so we increased our MRR from February to March in with 120%. And we're reaching profitability now in, in June. So we're really um, raising funds now to, to grow even faster and to employ more people. Um, yeah, we're, we're really, really proud of uh, being able to say that we are the highest rated uh, food and beverage order solution in, in Sweden, and we've built uh, every line of code ourselves. So, uh, yeah, that's basically it. Thank you for listening. Cool. Thanks. Good presentation. Um, so what, what was your customer acquisition model today? How do you find new customers? Mm. Uh, today, actually, we, we're mainly uh, going on recommendations from our existing customers, but we also uh, get uh, some conversions from our web page where we have a uh, good uh, SEO structure. Hmm. And um, in terms of competition, because um, I've looked at a couple of different solutions that sound fairly similar, why, why do you think you're rated higher? Um, what sort of, what's your edge in terms of compared to competitors? Mm. Yeah, yes, as you, as you um, know, there are a lot of competitors in this space, um, but uh, in our niche, there are main, mainly we and two other players, and we define it as meeting places where they have more than 25 tables. So we're really specified on on-site ordering. Uh, so larger uh, sports bars or um, parks and resorts and that kind of stuff. So that's our niche in the, in the market. And there is not really that many players there. Uh, most of the players are POS systems or provide this kind of white label uh, solutions for the customers. Right. Yeah, um, thank, yeah thank yeah. you, Rebecca. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, let's move on to Matthias. Uh, we're a little bit uh, running out of time here. Great. Yeah, Matthias, Great. please go ahead. Uh, I go as fast as I can. <laughs> you hear me? Yes. I'm not muted. Yeah, okay. Uh,
So, fish farming is the world's fastest growing food sector. But before it can reach its full potential, there is a need of solving unsustainable challenges in having a high water consumption, pollution, the use of an unsustainable feed and a bad fish health with antibiotic treatment. My name is Matthias Jurstedt and I am CEO of Nära Naturlig. The company is farming fish and the farming takes place on land through a connected system of water tanks. We are revolutionizing fish farming by using nature's own concept how to clean and reuse water. In our technology, the farming water is cleaned in a natural way by algae, bacteria and other small organisms called microbes. Compared to today's fish farming that has complex and expensive cleaning fi filters. The residual products in the water is cleaned by the microbes and the fish in its turn will eat the microbes, creating a natural ecosystem inside the farm which is similar to a natural lake. And this also creates the most sustainable and natural feed for the fish. But how much better is our farming system? Compared to the most used land-based fish farm technologies, we have uh, unique advantages. We can lower the feed consumption of the farm by 30%, resulting in 50% lower production costs of the entire farm. In the fish feed, our technology can replace 100% of the animal protein towards plant-based and microbes compared to today's fish feed that rely on animal and soy protein. And actually, we could eat that directly as humans instead. By creating this natural environment and giving a natural feed, the technology promotes good fish health and becomes completely antibiotic-free. Microbes are actually nature's own experts oh, on how we break down residual products. Therefore, we are able to reuse a wide variety of nutritious waste from the whole food sector. Our innovation is also highly compatible with industries concerned in reusing their uh, residual heat energy, which provide us with the sustainable heating to the farm. And through this natural feed, we also achieve a superior taste of the fish. And last but not least, we can reuse 100% of the farming water and all residual products back into our production again. So this technology is probably the most water saving and circular fish farming technology ever developed. And we have uh, verified all of this by a doctoral study in Vietnam. And the fish species we choose to call is tilapia. It is a popular food fish all over the world. And I found a Nara Natuli with two world leading researchers. Anders Kisling, who is Sweden's only professor of fish farming, and Sergio Zimmerman, who is one of the best consultants in the world towards fish farming. Me and myself, I grew up on a cattle farm in the south of Sweden, and I have a Bachelor of Science directed towards entrepreneurship. Our business model is to establish regional fish farms with sales in that area, and our final vision is to take this technology to the international market through a franchise model. Thank you. Thank you. That was good, uh, good speed in that presentation. <laughs> so that was good. Yeah, a lot of information. Yeah, cool. So uh, this process you've developed sounds really amazing, you know, being able to reuse so much. Is it um, patented somehow or uh, just a trade secret or how do you protect, protect that process? Today? Right now it's a, it's a company secret and it's like um, business, um, they have done research on this technology since 2013, maybe, but also the, the main things around it since before I was born. So it's like really the two researchers, uh, as I mentioned, Anders and Sir, it's their branch knowledge and research knowledge and combined with uh, the, the research we have done. And we will try to make a patent after the current pilot study we're doing in Sweden right now, but um, Maybe it's it's like uh, a recipe of microbes and stuff. So maybe it will be hard. So probably it will be a uh, know-how inside a company. Hmm. And what's your plan for scaling this? Will you be building your own brand, or will you be scaling with resellers or like become ingredient companies for other? Or what is your plan to? Yeah. To what 
what we see here is that uh, Sweden is really underdeveloped and uh, there is need of something like Arla in Sweden for fish farming. And that is what we want to create a brand and we want to find people that want to create. And we, because I think people would like to grow this fish, but they want to know and risk-free that somebody will buy it. And we that is the main uh, thing we want to make. And Nära Naturlig brand, uh, we buy up the fish. But also, like, uh, we are the know-hows, the best in, in Sweden of, of fish farm in general. We can build the fish farm. We can take care of the fish farm. We, we deliver the, and, and we need to de deliver because only we know how to take care of it and what kind of production material that you should put into this. Because if you do not take care of this uh, microbes um, farm, uh, the fish will not be, water will not be cleansed. So we need to... Uh, do that and we will deliver the production material for that. Hmm. Interesting. And and is there any downside to this uh, magical process? Like will, any in terms of cost or any downside on, on your choice um, of process? I mm -hmm. think it, the downside it's uh, it's quite still quite early uh, in the innovation. So it will need some more uh, one big thing that we want to test is also making this into aquaponics, where you take in a, a, a vegetable farm, because this could be uh, the next vegetable uh, aquaponic system, and we have this free. So it's probably uh, there is some time uh, in still product development before, uh, but the, before we really can... Uh, make this big leap into making it. But there is a really high demand of the product, both the, in Örebro and Coop Sverige and Axe Food. Uh, and also I had a, a, a talk today with Max Burgers, the chef of there. And everybody wants to sign up to like test material, which we will get in the, in the end here of this year. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, let's move on to a rush from Simply No Waste. Fantastic. Uh, can you allow me to share my screen? Yeah, oh. uh, Matthias, you need to unshare. Uh, yeah, there. Can you see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. Well, we are very excited to tell you about our project. Uh, hopefully we can get you to tag along. Um, currently the population of the earth is about 7.4 billion people living on this planet. And to feed these people, we produce 5.2 billion tons of food every year. Between half to one third of this food goes to waste immediately before it gets to our table. Some of the numbers might not make that much sense. Uh, let's just narrow it down to local part. Only Swedish uh, food waste uh, is about 1.3 billion tons. It means that if we fill out uh, Globe Stadium four times, we still have some food left. Or just to feed uh, 258 million people who are suffering from starvation. My name is Arash, and together with my business partner, Emil, we are a founder of Simply No Waste. Simply is a food, -based comp food tech company uh, with the focus on upcycling residue products. All the challenges with the food waste has created tremendous pressure on our resources, such as land, such as fresh water, and is responsible for 8% of the CO2 emission. And we believe that action needs to be taken. Our action is in a consumer product, in a form of consumer products, and we upcycle residue products from avocado. Uh, and then we combine them with other fruits and veggies, preferably those that uh, they might go to waste and with no added sugar. Uh, we believe our project and our fizzy, pro uh, fizzy beverages has a direct impact on the community's health because it's full of nutrition, full of, uh, full of antioxidants and vitamins. Uh, it saves money for the other businesses so they don't need to pay for uh, waste removal. And uh, it save uh, and it has effect on on environment, which save lands and resources and fresh water that's been used uh, before to produce these products. And in line with the UN Sustainable Development Agenda number two, three, six, and twelve, our authentic, locally produced fizzy beverages is for anyone with a healthy lifestyle, 
uh, who wants to have a positive impact on the environment and feel good about their purchase. So if you feel like that project is interesting, please tag along. Uh, you can follow us on uh, Instagram, simply dot no waste, or just contact us directly and we'll be happy to tell you more about it. And uh, if there is any detailed question, we can tell you there right there. Thank you. That was less than two minutes, wasn't it? <laughs> well done. <laughs> that was, yeah, quick as well. So that was good. So I, I, um, are you planning to build your own sort of consumer brand around this Simply No Waste? Or will you be de delivering sort of products to other uh, brands so what, what's the plan mm. well, what's the plan is is basically we are developing the product right now we yeah. do uh, have a cooperation with the facility we are developing we will uh, develop the recipe and how we do these residue products and what we do with them uh, and then we are we just granted uh, our application to bullock market so uh, we are registered the uh, actually bullock so we're gonna go mm. for uh, producing uh, the prototype testing market and and then uh, hopefully we're going to be launching it towards august and september mm. and then our primary target is uh, restaurant chains to start with that's where, where i'm very familiar with with my background and mm. then uh, further into we have some uh, agreements and some uh, uh, some acceptance from from uh, local uh, cafes and restaurants at this point mm. And sort of your long-term vision here, is it focusing on, on one category or one type of product or, or what, what do you want to be like? What, what's your long-term vision here? What, what do you want to build? Mm. Well, uh, long-term we'd like to, because in general, all these uh, upcycle products are things that we don't want to exist. So mm. uh, when you look at it further ahead, we would like to use multiple uh, byproducts in, in different fields and create different products in, in that all has to do with the same end goal of, of reusing resources. Mm. The, the whole agenda and the vision of the company, the tagline, if you can put it, is using our resources as sustainable as possible. At this stage, we have the resources uh, to produce these fizzy beverages. Mm. When, when we are slightly into this, we have another stage, we have another product which I can tell you uh, privately uh, that we are planning to develop it, which is very exciting because it's based on, on the byproducts and then we can actually develop that further in. Mm. Cool. And how, how does it actually work logistically and with the raw material being recycled and as you scale and get getting access to, to that uh, sort of raw material, the recycled uh, products that you need to, to scale, how, how do you make it all work uh, when you scale? It's, it's a very good question. Um, so basically, the, our business model is based on circular economy. So uh, we do have an agreement with one of the major suppliers that they, we can get their uh, residue products and we deliver them to, uh, to, to the, the factory we are trying to produce it and from there we're going to make it federally. Um, there are two different uh, suppliers. They, they're mainly supplying the restaurants and, and cafes. That's a middle supplier, and there's a huge, and then the bigger supplier, which they produce, they, they, they supply um, a majority of the Nordic uh, um, supermarkets. Those are big players. And then when we, when we want to get some products from them, we have to get a volume such as tons and tons. It doesn't come in like 200 kilos. It comes like three trucks. <laughs> so those are, those are, we have them. We have a good, they, they are all my previous uh, colleagues that I used to work with. So I, I have them for further in when the production uh, volume goes up. But right now we are having a contact with the middle suppliers that they, they supply supermarkets and they have so many um, uh, waste and byproducts so we can use them. When it comes to the factory, then we put them through the process of uh, pasteurizing and then, uh, and then uh, make, them make sure that there's no bacteria gets involved and then we put them through our process to go further in. And you'll have your own sort of manufacturing and your I wish we could, uh, <laughs> we could put that investment. No, we, we managed to uh, get a help from uh, Kirinova Startup House. They got us in touch with the, the, the company that actually they produce drinks. So they, we are working with them and then, and then uh, kind of renting about they're using their expertise a lot as well. So they help us with the production. That's probably smart to begin with. 
we, we, we don't have a 20 million to put on our own factory. Hopefully it's going to come later, but let's see. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, guys, for the presentation. Um, uh, like this is uh, coming to the end of the event. Are there, do you guys have any final questions for Rebecca? It seemed to be all crystal clear. Then I have uh, one final question for you, Rebecca. So among of the five founders, uh, which uh, we talk about the satian, you know, uh, the, the bacon, the fish, and the also more efficient payment uh, in the restaurant. Uh, what, what industry in the food sector excites you the most? Yeah, I like all these companies. I think there's definitely potential. Um, I, what I am missing a little bit, I mean, I, I would like to see more sort of food companies wanting to uh, um, challenge sort of the, the incumbents and help them change. Like, so I, I kind of see like the, the meat producers and the milk producers and the, the incumbents in this food tech industry, they, they should be feeling the pressure just like the car manufacturings are feeling the press, pressure from Tesla and would be so hungry for solutions to transform into some more sustainable options and, uh, and start to, you know, making alternative proteins themselves, you know? So, so that's just a general thing that excites me if, if companies can be part of helping sort of incumbents transform into, you know, the future of food. Um, so, but I, I like alternative proteins uh, a lot. It is difficult because it is really competitive. Uh, so, so building brand, um, if you want to go that route and building that community makes a lot of sense, you know, like you're on to with the bacon there and also with the seitan. Um, so, but how do you compete over time and what will the, you know, how will the pricing change over time? It's, it's difficult to know with these alternative proteins, but I think what we do know is that there's, you know, a large increase in demand from customers, which is so positive into this market and also huge hunger from the capital market wanting to invest in a lot more food tech uh, companies, which is really positive, I think, and will drive uh, transformation and change, uh, which, which is needed, so. Yeah, thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, I'm just wondering that if the fun, if the founders would like to follow up with you, how can they uh, reach out to you? Yeah, just email me. My email is on Industry Founders website, I hope, or otherwise on LinkedIn. Um, and I love meeting founders early. Uh, and I, because uh, some of you might be a little bit too early for us uh, still, but happy to uh, keep me keep me up to date how how you are doing if you are too early right now and. Uh, that's only positive because then we know each other when it's time for an investment round that that is a little bit larger. So yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> yes, and uh, Hannes, um, I don't know if you're still with us, but uh, uh, do you have any final words regarding why uh, investors should be paying attention to Squon now when it comes to food sector? Well, if you look at, I, I've been working a bit with uh, Sweden Food Arena, where we've been looking at the innovation. Uh, uh, capability within uh, the food industry. And when you measure it, it's not that great, which has many, many reasons for, for among which one is that they measure only companies that are more than 10 employees. So uh, if they did, and uh, they did, and uh, they've done a, an, uh, a report from uh, Jönköping University, University, and it's just been released. And it says that uh, innovation capability is about the same as in other businesses. For me, working with SMEs, uh, the innovation um, energy within this uh, part of the business is so huge. It's fantastic. And I would really like to talk to you, Rebecca, a little bit about how can we, because we are almost always in earlier stages, but then you move, then you have some of the companies that you feel that, well, okay, this could take off. So uh, we need to find an interface where we don't, uh, where we where we talk to each other and where we don't, uh, so that we know now this company is ready and we can prepare them and then they can pitch for you or whatever we do. But it would be really interesting to look at the, at the interface between uh, the innovation system, which we in some way represent, especially when it comes to SME food companies. And as I said, from earth to earth, so it's technology, it's everything, it's transportation, it's everything, uh, and uh, and uh, investments. Mm, no, happy to do that. I, I love engaging early on and see how, how mm -hmm. 
can be part of, so just like you say, identifying Call the me. one. <laughs> 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 don't, yeah, connect afterwards, for sure. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for everybody who joined us today. Um, this will be the end. Um, hopefully, yes. It's such, this is the luxury of my job, like getting, I get so much energy listening to your company pitches and it's amazing what you're doing. So keep up the good work. You're the hardworking, uh, amazing hero. So keep it up. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank have a nice day. You. Bye bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Tudo bem, Dani? Tudo joia. Tá arrumada, hein, tá? Oh, uh, yeah, I think we'll close this one because I think it's still on recording. That's true, yeah. Talk to yeah, you later. Yeah, 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 talk to you later.